Tonight on KQED Newsroom, Bay Area counties extend the stay-at-home order for another month to slow a possible surge in COVID-19 cases. Are the extreme measures making a difference? Also, the largest relief package in U.S. history is leaving some workers behind. We'll hear what's being done to help the most vulnerable survive. Plus, a local artist shares her crafty solution to help first responders fighting the pandemic while keeping her business afloat. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. We continue our coverage of the coronavirus pandemic, which has now infected more than one million people and claimed more than 50,000 lives around the world. Tonight, we begin with local efforts to slow the transmission of the coronavirus and COVID-19, the disease it causes. This week, all nine Bay Area counties extended a stay-at-home directive until the beginning of May. New restrictions are also now in place. They include banning most new construction, closing dog parks, playgrounds, and public picnic areas. Also, California students will likely continue distance learning for the rest of the academic year. So far, California hospitals have not seen the rapid surge in COVID-19 cases, which have overwhelmed New York and other hotspot regions. Also this week, top White House scientists revealed data showing that actions like social distancing and shutting non-essential businesses do work. They can slow a surge in new cases if done early and aggressively. Joining us now is Dr. George Rutherford, an infectious disease epidemiologist at UC San Francisco. Dr. Rutherford, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. We know this is a busy time for you. You've been an epidemiologist for four decades. You've worked on the HIV crisis, on Ebola, on Zika, on SARS, and you've used that knowledge to help advise the city and county of San Francisco. And you helped advise them on their early shelter-in-place orders. Can you tell us what we're seeing as a result of that early decision? So the, first of all, the decision was, I mean, really courageous. And it was taken by the mayor, the boards of supervisors, or the surrounding counties, Mayor Berkeley, and uh, all the health officers. Uh, it's really an, an unprecedented thing in uh, for the last hundred years in the United States. Wow. The shelter in place order is a huge uh, intervention in, in uh, for public health. And we really haven't used it since 1918 to this extent. What it does is stop transmission. Yes, there continues to be small amounts of transmission in households where people get sheltered together, from people going back and forth to work, especially uh, those going back and forth to hospitals if infection control is not in the right place, and for the you know the the inevitable leakage of people who might get infected on their way to the store or or whatever. But it's a huge intervention. We moved very quickly to put shelter in place uh, in in place. So we were sheltered in place for a full week before the first person died. Looking at other places, and we look a lot at Southern California, um, which went to shelter in place four days later, uh, we can see some we can see some differences. Now, a lot of that could just be random variation. But it could also uh, it, potentially be because of these shelter in place orders, correct? I mean, coronavirus well, cases course, that certainly, certainly seem yes, like they're ab- on the rise, but yeah. they're not as quick as they are in other places, such as uh, New York. Absolutely, 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 positively. So do you now, see this as it's just, the Bay Area bending or flattening the curve? It's certainly one way it could be taken. I think we really need to see another week's worth of data or so before we're really able to say that with any great degree of certainty. What I can say is that this is certainly what we want to see, and I encourage everybody to keep doing what they're doing. Now, one of the issues that we have is the number of tests. The production of tests is ramping up, but it's still nowhere near where public health officials want the volume to be. Uh, What is the number of tests that we have? What is the number of tests that we need for people to feel like we're in a good place? And can we get there? Yeah, we can get there. Uh, Given right now that what's in short supply are nasopharyngeal swaps, the swaps that you Uh, get the specimens with. That's a real rate limiting step. So we're uh, we're uh, repurposing other kinds of swabs. We're uh, looking towards manufacturers to give us uh, give us more, more, more. And we we would like to be running as about 3000 tests a day in San Francisco, just San Francisco. Um, And we would like to, you know, have that kind of volume uh, run for the entire month of April. We're uh, we're going to probably be there 
about this time next week. And how many are we running right now? I think this week there were seven. It's about 1,700 per day this week. So about half of what we need. A little less, a little more than half, yes, but yeah. you're right. Okay. There have also and been... it's on the it's on a steep part of a curve, so we're gonna. We're going to catch up. Moving up quickly. Okay. There have also been increased recommendations for everyone to wear some sort of face covering when they go out in public. And this is a change from the earlier guidance that said you should only wear a mask if you're sick or if you are treating a sick patient. Tell us about how that change occurred and what it means for us. Sure. So as we move away eventually from shelter in place, we have to have other interventions in place. And this is one of them. The the absolute priority for, uh, for masks has to go First and foremost, to people working in hospitals, frontline uh, first responders, and uh, the pre-hospital system. Those are the people whom we can ill afford to have get sick and and stop working. So that's the first priority. Mm -hmm. There are other priorities, for instance, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, and so on. So now, as we we really still don't have that solid a supply of those, Uh, So what we're asking people to do as an intermediate uh, intervention as we start to move eventually away from shelter in place is to get used to wearing masks outside. Now, lots of people have masks that they've had from construction work or gotten at hardware stores or gotten off the shelves at supermarkets. Those are great. That's fine. If you don't have those, you can you can wear a scarf, you can wear a bandana, you can wear a handkerchief over your nose and face. The and point here is that it's not meant to protect you. It's meant to protect others from you. So, so how effective infected, is that? Well, to protect others from you, it's really, it's, you know, it'll nobody keep, actually It'll has keep everything proof. inside the mask. It'll keep it inside you, which is the original purpose of surgical masks. When you're doing surgery, you don't want to be sneezing and coughing into an open wound. I mean, that's what they're really designed to do. So that's the idea. We're trying to keep the, uh, keep the germs, keep your germs to yourself. So you are connected to research that's not only being done at UCSF, but also at Berkeley, at Stanford, and at other locations throughout the Bay Area. Can you tell us about the web of work that's being done to slow the transmission of COVID-19 here in the Bay Area? It's, it's, it's remarkable. I, I sat through medical grand rounds at UCSF yesterday, and the number of clinical trials that's going on is simply remarkable. And we're seeing Lots of things being tried, uh, uh, and these are medications that are meant to treat people who are uh, all the way from mildly ill to an extremist. Um, we're seeing incredible amounts of basic science, drug discovery. Um, I know at Stanford they're doing a lot of molecular uh, work as well. The pace of research is, is enormous. At UCSF, we've really stopped all our research except for COVID research. So UCSF is a massive research engine, as is Stanford and Berkeley, and we've really repurposed our research to deal exclusively with this problem, this most pressing public health problem, for you know as long as we need to. And the as we're starting to see all sorts of new things come out, everything from uh, from apps to for for trying to understand where people have been in order to do better contact tracing, to better diagnostics. To, uh, to drugs, to drug discovery, to drug development, um, and to understanding the basic biology of the, uh, of the organism. And so from all of this research, when do you think we will see a cure, something that could be effective for that, or a vaccine? Well, the vaccine's a ways away, and that's the end game, right? So what we're trying to do is temporize until we can have a vaccine and provide 100% population immunity or enough popular, close enough to 100% that we truly achieve herd immunity. Until that time, we have to go through a lot of in-betweens. You know, we have to go through a lot of, as I said, temporizing steps of which shelter in place is the most is the most draconian, but it's almost like treating a, a, a cancer. You try and get rid of the bulk of the cancer to start with, and then you sort of mop up down the line. And it's a kind of similar strategy to that. It's, or forest fires, if you will. You want to have to put out the main fire, and then you have to deal with the hot spots as they pop up after that. One of the issues with that is that we are not completely isolated. We we are sheltering in place here in the Bay Area and in California, but in other states across the nation, particularly in the South, they have been much slower to make those decisions. Some still have not done that. What will the impact be of those decisions in other states on residents here in California? 
Yeah, that's absolutely the issue. That's absolutely positively the issue. Because we're going to do all this work. We're going to have made the sacrifices. We're going to have um, you know, halted our economy to try and save you know, 10, 20,000 lives. And meanwhile, others are just, you know, are not making those kinds of sacrifices. And they're going to continue to have transmission. They're going to have their own forest fires burning. And they're going to be able to ignite, you know, um, new, uh, new outbreaks here. Because at the end of the day, if we're successful, we're going to have certainly less than 5% and maybe even less than 1% of the population immune. So we're still vulnerable. The way for us not to be vulnerable is for other states to do what we're doing. So we've leveled the playing field, pushed transmission down, way, way down, and we're able to deal and go through and pick up uh, individual cases and new small new outbreaks. Dr. Rutherford, these feel like dark days. What gives you hope? Well, what gives me hope is that we're seeing low levels of cases here. Now, if you're a patient, you're, you don't feel like a low level cases, mm -hmm. but we're seeing, you know, relatively handfuls of cases per day. Our hospitals have the capacity. They're exceptionally well prepared uh, for this. We have health departments who will act aggressively and who will act decisively to protect the public's health and to reduce both morbidity and more importantly, mortality um, across the region. That's what the best, that's the real take home from this story. Dr. Rutherford, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, thank you. This week, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors announced financial help for city residents who don't qualify for money from the $2 trillion federal relief package. The emergency fund would provide $500 a month to qualifying undocumented immigrant workers as restaurants and other job sites have closed. Other Bay Area localities and nonprofits are also stepping up with financial assistance. In San Francisco, Mission Asset Fund is raising money for low-income workers, students, and immigrant families who don't qualify for federal coronavirus relief. This week, it started giving $500 cash grants to Bay Area families and other vulnerable residents. With me now by Skype is the CEO and founder of Mission Asset Fund, Jose Quinones. Jose, how has the response to this cash grant been going? It's only been a few days that you've had this online. Uh, tell me about the response. Yes, uh, Juan, thank you for having me. Uh, we started the fund uh, several weeks ago, trying to fundraise uh, to, to provide help and assistance to individuals, uh, families who we knew were going to be left out from any federal uh, aid package. Uh, you know, we've been working with immigrant communities, uh, low-income folks, undocumented folks who, you know, we feel that are just as worthy of assistance, you know, now more than ever. Uh, they're the ones that are still working. They're still in the front lines of this pandemic. I mean, they're the ones that are keeping, you know, our, 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 our food supply food chain intact. They're the ones that are stocking our, our, the shelves in our grocery stores. They're the ones that are not getting any assistance from the federal government. So we started our fund uh, several weeks ago and started fundraising around that principle. And you know, in a span of a couple of weeks, we raised over $4 million. So that, that way we can help uh, families and students, you know, other low wage workers, you know, in, in a small effort. But we definitely know that our, our fund is not enough. I mean, the financial pain that people are feeling is great and it's real. The anxiety is high. And because people just don't know, we don't know where we fit in, in the world right now. And so any help uh, uh, is, is appreciated, you know, but we need to do more, definitely. Well, I do want to come back to the response to this grant. You put it online earlier this week and you had $4 million that you are able to uh, give out in these $500 cash grant in, in, uh, increments. Um, tell mm -hmm. me what the response level has been like. It's been immense. I mean, we started uh, an application just yesterday to try to reach out to our, you know, college students, saying that we're here to help. You know, apply. And let us know where you're at. You know, tell us a little bit about your story. You know, and you know, we expected some response, but we were overwhelmed with the response that we got. Uh, you know, to the point that we had like over sixty-seven thousand uh, people, you know, oh sign goodness. up. You know, to to get uh, some help. And again, this is, these are our students uh, all over the state, people that are, are filling the, the pinch, people you know, who left their, you know, their, their campuses, their housing. You know, they probably went back to live with their parents if they had that, that situation. And they really are in, in danger or very precarious in that. And, and it's not that they can go back to the labor market to start working because there were students that weren't working. 
and now there's really nothing for them. So the pain is real, uh, the concerns are real, and, and I think we got a sense of that through this application process. Uh, tell me about the funding itself. Where were you able to raise this money, especially during a very difficult time? Who are your donors? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, fortunately, we've been working with, uh, you know, partners in the philanthropy world. Uh, we started this work with College Futures Foundation. Uh, we started engaging them, thinking about what is it that we can do together to provide some relief, you know, for students. And, and soon enough, other foundations uh, joined our effort. Uh, we had the Levi Strauss Foundation, you know, just joined. We had Tipping Point, the Weingart Foundation, you know, and others who have uh, contributed to the fund. You know, because they all care, they all want to do something, and we provided, you know, a uh, sort of like a means to make that happen. But again, we know that, you know, four million dollars, even if we get to five million dollars or six million dollars, we know that that's not enough. Uh, but but what is important to note is that we need to step in, we need to stand in solidarity with those left behind and those other people that are undocumented immigrants. You know, who the federal government is just really, truly not providing them any assistance whatsoever. You know, just because they have a 19 number, for example, even though they contribute to the tax base, they spend billions of dollars in, you know, contributing to the tax base. And in the moment of need, you know, uh, we're sort of stepping away from them. And so at this point, I think, you know, civil society, philanthropy, nonprofits, even local governments need to step in and really try to rectify that, that problem. Could you tell me a little bit about the scope of the need, particularly here in our region? Who qualifies for this aid? Well, we definitely are trying to target our assistance to people that are um, you know, undocumented. In the Bay Area, for example, we know that about 580,000 individuals live in the Bay Area who are, are undocumented. It's so about 2 million people across the state. And so, so, so you know, so very, they're, just, they're among us. They're people that our friends, our families are you know, our neighbors, people that, that, that are part of our society. And so we definitely want to step in and send, you know, either uh, at least some relief, you know, but at, at, at the most also send them a message of, of hope and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, saying that, that we're here you know, to stand with them in solidarity through this, you know, on, on horrific crisis. What do you expect this money to do for your clients? You know, so we're uh, contributing $500 uh, as a one-time grant, uh, and we expect for them to use that money to, you know, buy groceries, uh, to pay for the bills, to give them a sense of, uh, of ease, even though it might be temporary. You know, but we're also trying to use that, elevate that, so that we can actually get our political leadership, whether local or state, or in particular federal level, to say that we can't allow this to happen. We have to step in and provide assistance to everybody. You've been working with vulnerable populations for many years. What new learnings have been revealed through this pandemic? I think, uh, you know, what this pandemic has taught us is that, um, you know, life is, you know, is very um, precarious. I mean, you know, our situation can change from one moment to the next. And so, so we have to, you know, be there for each other, take care of each other, be with our families, love the people around us. I think, I think that's really important. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is that, you know, for a very long time, society has always blamed poor people for their own poverty. We blame them for not having uh, earning enough, for not having a job. We blame them for just their situation. And, uh, and it, but in this pandemic has taught us anything is that, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're in this together. Uh, you know, people's poverty is now is not their fault. And so this is really a, a moment for us to sort of see uh, how we're all equal and how we need to bind together and come together in solidarity so that that way we can make it out of this crisis together. Jose Quinones, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. To see if you're eligible and to apply for a cash grant from Mission Asset Fund, visit missionassetfund.org. For weeks now, healthcare workers and first responders have been pleading for more face masks and other personal protective equipment as they work to save lives. It's a problem in need of an urgent solution, even a DIY one. Last week, San Francisco-based artist and shop owner Jenny Lenick held an online workshop on how to sew face masks, which are in short supply on the commercial market. Lenick repurposed leftover fabric from the clothes she used to make before the pandemic. She taught dozens of people who created and then donated homemade masks to health workers around the nation. Joining me now is Jenny Lenick, the owner of Jenny Lemons and a San Francisco-based artist. Jenny, increasingly there are recommendations to wear some sort of face covering when out in public. Is this increasing your motivation to have more of these online workshops? Yes, absolutely. 
we just, in fact, added another workshop next week on April 14th. We just had such a outcry of support of different people that wanted to help and make masks. So we wanted to offer them something else. How did this idea to offer a free virtual workshop come about for you? My friend Rachel Kong from The Ruby, which is a gathering space for creative women, reached out to me and asked if I wanted to help her facilitate a workshop. Um, she did all of the organizing and I was the creative root behind it. So tell me about the process of going virtual and teaching people to make these masks online. Had you been doing virtual workshops before? Or what was that shift like? Sure. I've been teaching workshops in person for many years. Um, when the pandemic struck and we had to shelter in place, I actually had to cancel every workshop we had through April and May. Um, so I wanted to offer my customers something. The transition to moving online seemed very natural um, and has been a lot of fun. How much technical skill does a person need to make a mask? Do you need to be a seamstress or uh, I don't know what the equivalent of that is for a man, someone who can sew? I, I like to call them sewists. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Learn something every so, day. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you need to be able to use a sewing machine. A lot of people have asked me if I would recommend doing it by hand. And yes, you could if you're doing, making one for yourself. Sew it by hand. It just would take forever. Um, but yeah, a basic knowledge of sewing on a sewing machine is definitely preferred. Okay. How many people have participated so far and how many masks have been made? So our online workshop had about 35 views, um, but I donated fabric and elastic like sewing kits to our customers. Um, and I ended up sending out about 400 masks. So we definitely had that many made. Um, a lot of people just ordered one single mask pack and to teach them how to make the masks. And I think the people sent out many more than that. I heard from one person individually, she made 85 masks. And they're often being donated to healthcare workers and people are also making masks for themselves. I understand that you've got some family involvement as well. Your grandmother <laughs> in uh, yeah. Minnesota has also been helping out. Yep, she wanted to help and a group of cardiologists here in San Francisco um, requested a dozen masks. And so I reached out to her. my grandma and said, hey, can you make these for me? <laughs> and she did. Um, it's great that you have that help and people across the nation can get involved with this. It's something you can definitely do while you're still at home and sheltering in place. Jenny, can you describe what happened during the virtual workshop and if there was anything surprising that emerged? One thing that was great was how interactive it was. People were able to ask questions. I was able to see them um, on video. And we even spent a little bit of time talking about other stuff in the workshop, like sewing projects people were working on at home. And one of the surprising things was how people loved to share their project online. Um, that was really fun to see. Does it seem like a new pathway for community and connection that you didn't have before? Yeah, absolutely. I. After doing the face mask workshop, I did an embroidery workshop the next day. And people joined from New Orleans to Michigan to Spain. And that was just such an awesome opportunity to share and be creative with people all over the world. That's really interesting, an opportunity to bring yeah. in this sort of global community that you can't in a storefront. Totally. I mean, in my shop, the people who come take our classes are you know, we're on 24th Street in the Mission, and it's people from who, Fernal Heights and Noe Valley and the Mission that are coming. And he, it's just great to have such a big reach with online. Jenny, let's turn now to the business side of things, because you are a small business owner in San Francisco, and this is a difficult time to be a small business owner. First, tell me about Jenny Lemons. When did you start it, and what was it all about? Sure. So Jenny Lemons... Um, I started it in 2015 and it began as a clothing line. In 2017, I got my retail space on 24th Street and 
changed the space into a workshop space, a place to make and sell my own handmade clothing, and then also carry goods by other local and independent artists from across the country. And you also perform uh, craft sessions for some of the businesses in the area, yes? Yes. So we do team building um, workshops for all different startups and tech companies across the area. And what sort of an impact has the coronavirus had on your business? You've had to shut your doors, obviously. Yeah. So unfortunately, I had to furlough my retail staff, which has been a, a real tragedy. You know, <laughs> they, they're they out of work at the time being. But um we've moved our business online as much as possible and having our online workshops has helped a lot. Um, it's, you know, nothing compared to what we used to have. I mean, we were teaching four workshops in person a week on top of all the team building we did, and we can't do any of that anymore. And how are you doing with all of this? I mean, it must make you uneasy, not only for your employees um, and for yourself, but for your customers. Are, are you yeah. sleeping at night? I'm sleeping at night pretty well. <laughs> um, I, my husband, he calls me a cockroach, meaning that <laughs> if like a huge tragedy happens and everyone else has perished, I will somehow still survive. Um, I've really use this as an opportunity to pivot. So moving all of our products that were once on just available in our store, they're all available online now. We're trying to have as many online workshops as possible. And really I'm using this time to refocus the business in a lot of ways. Um, people have really been buying a lot of art supplies from us online. So like if people want that, I wanna provide that for them. So I'm trying to find more art supplies and kits um, to get people creative while staying at home. Jenny, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Best of luck to <laughs> thank you. Thank you. As always, you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash kqednewsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me through my social media handle, Priya D. Clemens. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe. <laughs>